worship today here at Western Boulevard Presbyterian Church. We welcome you and are glad that you are here, especially if you're visiting with us today. We hope you find here an encounter with the living, loving God. On this, the second Sunday of Advent, um, we are also grateful for our continued journey toward Bethlehem as we welcome our Savior on Christmas Day. There are a lot of things happening in the life of Western Boulevard Church, and you'll see those things listed on the purple uh, announcement sheet in your bulletin. Um, I have a couple of things to especially call your attention to. One is that we're grateful this morning. Unfortunately, Elizabeth Davis came down with food poisoning this morning, and she is not with us today, and hence we, she, we will not be having the concert at 4 o'clock this afternoon as we had originally planned. We're going to reschedule that to next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Uh, so plan to make those changes if you want and can come uh, and be here next Sunday afternoon at 4. Our prayers are with Elizabeth as she recovers. And we are very grateful. I am very grateful uh, for Elizabeth's close friend, Tanya Kirk, who she called this morning and is filling in for her and substituting for her on the piano. Tanya, welcome. We're glad that you are here. That saved us all from singing a cappella today. <laughs> Um, the other special announcement I want to make sure that, that we're aware of is that next Sunday, uh, the session has called a congregational meeting immediately at the close of the worship service, the morning worship service, for two purposes. One is for the election of officers uh, to the class of 2024, and the other is to approve the dissolution agreement, the dissolution of call between Associate Pastor Bruce Grady and Western Boulevard Presbyterian Church. You'll be receiving more information and details about the meeting this week in a a, a weekly word e in the in a group email to the congregation um, but I want to make sure that you are aware of that and plan to attend that meeting next Sunday at the close of worship there are many other things happening I trust that you can read and test test how think about how you can become a part of what's happening here at our congregation but as we begin our worship now I'm going to invite Millie to come forward and to lead us in the lighting of the advent wreath and the call to worship and in doing so I would invite us all to stand
Good morning. Good morning. Let us prepare for worship from the call of worship as printed in the bulletin. The Lord is coming to this temple. We watch and wait for his coming. We light this candle as a symbol of the purity of heart only God can bring. For he shall purify his people like gold and silver until they shine forth his righteousness. O come, O come, Emmanuel, we will sing verses 1, 2, 6, and 7. is coming back. In Advent, we prepare for the coming of the Lord, full of grace and truth. Trusting in God's unfailing grace, let us tell the truth about ourselves, joining in our prayer of confession, which is found in your bulletin. Together, refining God, you have sent us prophets and we have not listened. We have not always determined what is best or made way for your reign in our lives, our church, and our society. Forgive us, we pray, 
and renew our covenant within us. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, Zechariah, father of John the Baptist, proclaimed this hope. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, giving light to those in darkness, guiding our feet in the way of peace. Receive God's tender mercy today. Trust that God's peace will prevail for all those who seek Forgiveness in Jesus name. And as far as the east is from the west, so have our sins been removed from us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And God, through Jesus Christ, gives us peace. But the way we fully realize it is by sharing it with others. So I invite you to turn to your neighbors, look them in the eyes and say, the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. I would like to invite the children who are present to come join me here at the front. So we're going to spend a little time together. And just know today, what's a little different, is that you all, after the children's message, you're going to go back and sit with your families because uh, of having communion today. There won't be children's chapel today, okay? So yeah, come on and have a seat. How are you guys? Good. I like your antlers. Those look good. How are you all? Are you all... What, What's, uh, you guys, I wasn't here last week, and I came in to the church on Tuesday, and I was like, wow, it's time for Christmas, isn't it? You all were here, many of you were maybe here last week, and what happened during the service? It's hanging of the greens, wasn't it? Did you guys get to, you got to see, like, the youth and some of the other folks? You, maybe even you all helped put some of the, did, huh? did you? And it, what does that tell us when we have, when we put things up like that and we decorate? How does that help you all? What do we think about? It's, it's getting us ready, isn't it? We're getting ready. We're getting prepared. Do you guys do certain things at your house or with families to get, to get ready for Christmas? Do you put a tree up? Anything else? Decorate the tree. Decorate the tree. What? Make cookies. Oh, I want to come to your house. Cool. Say that again. Make gingerbread houses. Make gingerbread houses. Ooh, that was something that my girls love to do with their grandmothers. That was something fun to do. I was going to share with you today something we do at our house. That's been in our family, well, for quite a long time. So this is an advent calendar. And you won't believe this, but it was given to me when I was 
one year old. And it was made by um, a, a, a woman in the church. My dad was a minister. And it was in the church, a woman in the church who made it. And she made it, and it's got, what does it have? What do you see on the, what do you see there? It's got numbers and a ring, and then there are gifts, right? So when I was your age, this calendar was just for me. <clears throat> it's not anymore. <laughs> I have to share it, but that's okay. It was given to me as a way to kind of have different gifts and things as we get ready for Advent. And as I got older, we would share it within my family. And now my mom does this calendar for our family. So there's different colored paper depending on who gets the gift. And it's Aaron and Heather and Debbie and Frank. And some of the gifts, you'll notice some ribbons are off because the girls, they're still in college, so my mom is one who sends the gifts to them so they could open them when they get there. Um, but it's a fun way for us to kind of count down the days and to, and to think about what happens. And we saw that earlier when we lit the Advent wreath. Each Sunday we light a different candle. It's a way to help us get ready, to get prepared. And today we're going to hear a story about someone else who helps us to get ready for Jesus. And his name was John the Baptist. Have you ever heard of John the Baptist? What did he do? Do you remember anything about him? He baptized people in the Jordan River. He baptized Jesus. Was he, was he clean cut? No. no, he smelled, didn't he? He was kind of smelly and wore camel's hair and ate locusts. I mean, he was kind of this guy out in the wilderness. He was Jesus' cousin. cousin. That's right, because his mother was Elizabeth, right? You guys are smart. <laughs> One of the things that John, we hear John tell us today is what's important. We can, it's great to get gifts. It's great to do decorating. But what really matters most is how we prepare our hearts to welcome Jesus. And that is how we treat one another, how we show the love that God has shown us in Jesus, and we forgive each other. And so for me, that's a helpful reminder. We can all get caught up in the gifts and the things we want, but God wants us to really think about how we treat each other and love each other. And John's our helpful reminder today about that. Okay? So, let's have a prayer before we head back. Loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many ways you call us to prepare for the coming of your Son. And we ask that in our daily living, we might show that love and grace to all the people we come in touch with to truly prepare the way for you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. Have a great week. I'll let you go back and sit with your families. I invite you to join me in a prayer for illumination. Holy God, through your scriptures, you have revealed your word, your word to your people across many generations. In the fullness of time, you revealed your living word in Jesus Christ. Now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds and hearts to you so that we find new ways to follow you faithfully in this generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, from chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Listen now for God's word to us this day. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, 
the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. John went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the, in the, book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Maybe you were like our family and you spent some time traveling over highways this past Thanksgiving. We spent a lot of time in the car over six days, but it was well worth it to spend valuable time with our family and friends in West Virginia and in Indiana. And I hope you had similar experiences with those you love over Thanksgiving. It certainly had a deeper meaning and feel after what we all lived through one year ago in isolation and separation from each other. Growing up in West Virginia, I learned to drive on roads that were not straight. To get anywhere in a state that is full of mountains, the roads primarily follow the terrain. However, to make interstates or highways, mountainsides are removed and bridges are built to span valleys and gorges. There is a part of the West Virginia Turnpike just south of Charleston where the original two-lane highway passed through a tunnel in the mountain and then immediately afterward over a large bridge over a deep gorge. To make that highway an interstate, they made this huge cut in the mountain beside the tunnel, and then they filled all that earth in the gorge beside the bridge. So anytime I drive through my home state, and especially through that part of the interstate, I cannot help but think of the words of the prophet, every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. As we enter the season of Advent, we are all traveling on the road to Bethlehem. It's a road that we've traveled before, but the road may look different from year after year. One year, the road may be fairly smooth and straight with little stress and with great anticipation. The next year, the road may be especially bumpy and crooked with much uncertainty and great anxiety about what is around the next turn. Advent comes every year, but we can travel many different roads throughout our lifetime to meet God face to face in Bethlehem. One person who is always a part of this journey to Bethlehem each year is John the Baptist. We find him in all four of the Gospels, and every liturgical year, John is there in the wilderness. Why do we have to hear John the Baptist? Why do we have to hear him preach before we can welcome the Christ child on Christmas? There's a popular saying that you cannot get to Easter Sunday without going through Good Friday. To parallel that, why can't we get to Christmas Day without going through the wilderness and hearing John the Baptist? Maybe it has something to do with helping us to make our paths straight and to smooth out our rough places. As we talked about in our Bible study on Tuesday, Advent is not just about getting our decorations out for Christmas. At its center, Advent is about getting our whole selves ready 
body, mind, heart, and soul. And in John, we hear the vision which the prophet Isaiah spoke of. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John is God's messenger to the people and to us, that the one who is being sent is like no other, and it will require much of any who wish to follow him. Kathy Beach Verhey writes, Advent is a season of preparation. At home, people are cleaning, getting out their Christmas decorations, putting, purchasing a tree, baking, hosting and attending parties, and simply getting ready for Christmas. But into our Advent busyness, each year enters John the Baptist. He interrupts our schedules and demands that preparations of a different kind be made. John demands that we get ready for Jesus. In the style of Old Testament prophets before him, John challenges Advent people with a message of personal and corporate self-examination. Advent, John reminds us, is a time to prepare to welcome Jesus and not simply our invited Christmas house guests. John's challenge is to repent and prepare. True repentance, metanoia in Greek, means literally to change one's mind, to turn around, to reorient oneself. John calls all people to turn to God and away from sin, to seek God's forgiveness and to prepare the way of the Lord. God sent the message to John, not in Rome, not in Jerusalem, but way out in the wilderness. Not the seat of political or religious power, but the wilderness, the often scary and confusing place where God had spoken to God's people in the past and through which God had led God's people to a new and promised life. Our repentance, our turning around, will likely involve us looking at the structures and the systems and the people of the world around us in new and different ways. The word repent, it has a lot of negative connotations today. Maybe that's the result of Bible-thumping, fundamentalist religion. But in the context of today's passage, it's important to reclaim the theological meaning of this crucial biblical word. To turn away from sin. To turn toward God. And to reorient our lives with God at the center. This invitation to repent is not about legalism. At its core, repentance is about forgiveness and grace. John Calvin exhorted the church to hear the gospel in John the Baptist's call to repentance, not just the law. In Calvin's words, for John does not say, Repent ye, and in this way the kingdom of heaven will afterwards be at hand. But first brings forward the grace of God, and then exhorts all to repent. Hence, it's evident that the foundation of repentance is the mercy of God, by which he restores the lost. Where is grace in repentance? It is finding the forgiveness only God can give. The word translated forgiveness comes from a word in Greek which means to let go. When we turn toward God, we are turning toward the only one who has the authority and the power to let go of our sins, our pain, our burdens. When we receive forgiveness, the one whom we have hurt has let go of the pain we caused him or her. When we forgive another, we are willing to let go of the past pain and to live into a new light side by side. 
This is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. This is one way we are called to prepare earnestly and faithfully this Advent for God's Son. How straight or crooked are our roads? How smooth or rough are our paths? What makes our roads uneven and crooked? Fear? Sin? Guilt? Brokenness? Do we believe our journey will get easier by holding on to everything from our past? Or do we believe that to travel the road to grace, we must be willing to let go of our past and turn our lives over to God? How are we called to a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins as individuals, as the church, as followers of Christ? Over Thanksgiving, did, um, did you have any awkward family dinner conversations? You know, those great topics of politics or cultural issues or masks. I was fortunate <laughs> to not have any of those awkward family conversations. It probably was because we kept our, our groups in a very small, immediate family grouping. But I was blessed one night by a table conversation that spoke to me, especially as it relates to how we're called to prepare the way for Jesus as a community which proclaims that we are followers of His. The night after Thanksgiving, I sat at the table with Debbie's brother, Jeff, and his youngest son, our nephew, Miles. Jeff is a ruling elder at First Presbyterian Church in Bloomington, Indiana, and is a member of the pastor nominating committee for that congregation as they are searching for a new senior pastor. Miles is a senior at DePaul University and will be pursuing jobs in public policy uh, think tanks in the Washington, D.C. area after he graduates. Miles also runs cross country and track, and I still don't understand how much food that boy can eat and not put a pound on, but that's a whole nother topic of conversation. Anyway, as we sat and talked, we started to talk about the church and its future. And Jeff asked Miles, once he got settled into a new place after he graduates, what it would take for him to consider visiting or entering a church. And Miles said that it would have to be a place that shares his passions and his interests. For him, that is protection of the environment, that is eradicating systemic racism and poverty, that's being welcoming and inclusive to all of God's children. Otherwise, because his time is so valuable, he will find other groups or social networks to connect to, to connect to that value, what he values. If the church is to be relevant, much less thriving in the next five to 10 years, we must listen to the voices of our youth and young adults and not let them be drowned out by voices of complacency and fear. I have never heard a church say that they don't want to grow in numbers. I think that's pretty universal. But when we say that, do we really understand what comes with that statement? It means being open to the Spirit's movement, wherever it may lead us, and hearing new ideas from new voices, not as threats, but as invitations by God into a new life. It means letting go 
of what has weighed us down and reorienting ourselves to the mission God is calling us to. It means acknowledging where we have fallen short and, yes, where we have sinned, seeking forgiveness, and in living out our faith in the light of that grace. John the Baptist calls us to travel a road to grace this Advent season. It's a road that is filled with choices which we each have to make. Which way will we turn? Away from God or toward God? As we seek to reorient ourselves toward God, may we receive the gift of grace and forgiveness our God has given us so that all flesh shall see the salvation of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next hymn is number 96 on Jordan's Bank, The Baptist Cry. We're actually going to sing it to a different tune than what's in the hymnal. You pick up 96 and follow those words. That's what we're going to sing. But we're going to sing it to a more familiar tune, which I'm going to invite Tanya to play through as an introduction. invite us to remain standing and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which you'll find printed in your bulletin. Friends, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. My friends, we pause at this moment to come together in the sharing of our joys and concerns. Um, if you have a joy or concern, I believe that, that one of our good friends will come to you with a mic so that, we, so that we can share in this joy and concern. If you have a joy or concern, please raise your hand and let us know. Well, I have a few. Maybe I'll prime the pump. Uh, I'd like for us to give thanks to God for Nicholas Balomo, uh, who is the young man, the teenager who had um, surgery on his lung. 
um, in which they removed the spot. Uh, the surgery went well. There will be a second surgery after um, a little time has passed to remove the other spot. But we give thanks to God that this first part, the first surgery has gone well. And we ask for continual prayers. Um, I also am asking that we would lift up Elizabeth, Elizabeth Davis, as we all know, had food poisoning. And um, it is obvious that she's not feeling well. So we're praying for God's healing and recovery. And at the same time, I forgot your name, Tanya. We're praising God for you and your service and willingness. Amen. And I would also like for us to lift up Nan Grothman. Uh, Nan had a bit of an accident. She, this morning, she tripped in the stairwell um, in the education wing. Um, I know that the EMS was attending to her as I arrived to worship this morning. Um, and it seems, I did not speak to any of the EMS, but I spoke to one of her sons. And um, I also had the chance to speak briefly to John Ann. It seems that, you know, she's doing well, but we want to keep her in our prayers as she is being attended to. Um, are there any other joys or concerns? Yes, I want to thank the church again for praying for my son, Brandon. Um, he found out Tuesday that they removed all the cancer and it has not spread. And you'll find out more next Tuesday. <laughs> I just, is this working? Yeah. Hello. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank everybody for the prayers for my son, Brandon. They removed all the cancer, and it has not spread. And he'll find out more next Tuesday on if it's genetic or and do more blood work to find out if he's got to have any kind of treatment. And then my mom wanted to pray for her grandson. Just I'm going to take this off because I talk very well without it. Um, by having a big family, we've always got something going on. Lynn's talking about her son, who is also my grandson. I have a 12-year-old grandson whose mother was brought up in this church. Unfortunately, as my mother would say, she went to a, another church which she calls an off-brand religion. But, but anyway, he, his body is doing strange things, and he's going to a specialist next week. And I want you to pray for him. He's 12 years old, and he's a, he's a little doll baby, but of course I'm a little prejudiced. And there's one more thing that's really going to be hard for me to say. But I have a... Uh, my oldest son is 66. He has been on drugs ever since he was in, graduated from high school, not on a regular basis, on an off and, on, off and on basis. I don't want you to pray for him to get off drugs. Yes. I want you to pray for him to wake up one morning and realize that I need help. That's the main thing that I want God to give him some help. Because right as of this moment, I'm afraid he's lost his soul. But if you'll just pray for him, I know Western Boulevard helps because I'm sitting in this wheelchair right now. And God bless every one of you because I love you. Back, Sandy. I'd like to ask us to pray for our leaders and especially the, the lieutenant governor in North Carolina who is spewing a lot of hateful things about the LGBT community and we need to pray that God will 
set sights on him to help him have a, a way of love rather than a way of hate. Amen. Thank you. Is, are there any other joys, concerns? Let us bow our heads as we go before God's throne of grace. Our loving and most merciful God, even in the darkness, you see all and you know all. The joys and concerns that have been spoken and those that were kept in our hearts. We lay them down at your feet, God. We ask that you would reach out to each and every one who has been lifted. And God, we pray that you would heal, save, set free, deliver, awaken, and turn lives around. God, we ask that where there is hate, that you will transform to love, respect, and appreciate. And God, we pray where there is bondage, that by the power of your spirit, that you will set the captives free. We come against the forces of evil, the systems that dehumanize God. We come against all those things that cause us to walk in the ways of destruction. And we claim your promise that you came that we might have life and that more abundantly. Great God of promise, we ask that you would fulfill your promises even now. And Lord, give us the courage to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We now prepare our hearts as we celebrate God through the presentation of our lives and our gifts.
God of all righteousness, receive these gifts of gratitude, the offerings of our lives. Purify them with your refining fire, so that they may serve your purposes and shine with your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus said, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God creator and ruler of the universe. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You set us in this world to love and serve you and to live in peace with all that you have made. When we turned from you, you did not turn from us. When we were captives in slavery, you delivered us to freedom and made covenant to be our sovereign God. When we were stubborn and stiff-necked, you spoke to us through prophets who looked for that day when justice shall triumph and peace shall reign over all the earth. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the celestial choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, 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 holy Lord. Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent him into the world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior, to bring freedom to the captives of sin and to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering. We rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ as our host. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. And upon these are gifts of bread and wine. Yes, God. That the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of our Lord. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Strengthen us, O God, in the power of your Spirit to bring good news to the poor and lift blind eyes to sight, to loose the chains that bind and claim your blessing for all people. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, 
In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus was at table with his disciples. And after giving thanks, he took a loaf of bread and broke it. He said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup. He blessed it. He gave thanks and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. As often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth my death until I return. We will be serving today, as we have been uh, for the last several months, by intinction. So you'll, you're invited to come by the center aisle. And Bruce and I will be standing down here on either side of the poinsettias. And you're welcome to take one of the cups that has the bread and the juice all in it at once. And then to return to your seats by the side aisle. And then once everyone has been served, we will partake as one. Cup of salvation. Christ, body and blood given. Body of Christ, cup of salvation. Body, Christ, body and body blood Christ, given. Cup of salvation. Larry, Christ, body and body blood of Christ, cup of salvation. Body of Christ, cup of salvation. Body of Christ, cup of salvation. Body of Christ, body and blood salvation. Bread of heaven, cup of 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 salvation. Body of Christ, 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 cup of salvation. Sally, Christ, body and blood given for you. Body of Christ, cup of salvation. Christ, body and blood given for you. Body of Christ, cup of salvation. 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 Christ's body. But
gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Gracious and abundant God, even as we wait for the fulfillment of your creation, you meet us in Christ at this table, in this meal. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. Now send us into the world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and salvation with all whom we meet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 163, Wild and Lone, the Prophet's Voice. Friends, go from this place in peace, trust, and serve the Lord who is coming. And may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each of you now and forever. Amen.